This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Hi, Marilyn. We haven't started yet. We're just waiting for everybody to jump on. Good morning, everybody. Uh, like Brad said, we're just waiting for some other people to sign on. I had a couple of people calling me that were having issues signing on. So as soon as they get on, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you.
Hello? Hi. Good morning. Um, good morning. I think everybody's on um, now. So, uh, Brad, I don't know if we want to do introductions or if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself so we can get started. Sure. Uh, I'm happy to uh, do either. I can do introductions. Um, do you want everybody to introduce themselves or just myself and Ashley, who's here with me today that people don't know? I think if everybody could do a brief introduction, that'd be fantastic. So we know who's on the call. Sure. That sounds great. <clears throat> well, I'm going to go ahead. If uh, everybody's okay with it, I'm going to uh, record this session um, so that we can have it on file for, for later. Okay. That sounds good. So I'll go ahead and get started, and then I'm just going to run down the uh, list here and kind of call people out so we have some uh, order to introductions. My name is Brad Kruger. Um, I work at Asset Inc., who you guys have um, uh, the sub awardees have probably worked with in some capacity, and we work with Great Plains uh, Tribal Chairman's Health Board uh, with quite a few of their projects, helping out with the evaluation side of things. I've worked with Chad on a number of projects in Tinka. Um, on a variety as well. For those of you who remember the name Stella, she's with us here at Asset, so I work um, with her here on evaluation. And uh, next up on my list, I think Chad, um, you're familiar, but do you want to do a quick introduction and then Tinka? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Chad Radigan. I'm the program manager for the Chlorotal Cancer Screening Initiative here at the Health Board. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tinka Duran, and I'm the director of the prevention programs under with under which the colorectal Great Plains Colorectal Cancer Screening Initiative is under. So, good morning. Thank you. Great. Ashley, do you want to do a quick introduction? Sure. Um, so, I'm Ashley Kitchen. Um, I'm an evaluator here at Asset. Also, um, I've worked with Great Plains on a few projects now. Um, including the breast and, cancer, breast and cervical cancer um, early detection program. And um, I'm just sort of observing the webinar um, that Brad is presenting today. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. I have a list of uh, people who are just calling in. So um, if you know who you are, that's great. Caller two. or anybody on the telephone, if you guys just want to jump in, maybe that might be easier. Um, this is Megan Lynch from Diane River. My name is Nancy Velasquez. I'm with the Ponca Tribe. Sandy Anderson with Winnebago. Jody Fetch um, with Custer Health, serving the Standing Rock Reservation. Awesome. Dolores Poyer, Oglawas Tribe. Rhiannon Clausen, Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. This is Phil Jakewith with uh, NTC Tribe. This is uh, Clay Moran. I'm the CEO of the Trenton Community Clinic. Good morning, Jackie Arpan from Rapid City Service Unit. Good morning, Richard Sully, Yankton Sioux Tribe Health Education Office. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Anybody else out there we haven't heard from? I think that might be everybody on my list here. Hold on, Brad. We got a. Oh, this is Gina Johnson, patient navigator with the Corridor Cancer Screening Initiative. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this evaluation. Perfect. Presentation. Thanks, Gina. All right. Well, I'm just going to get up and running if there aren't any other announcements, Chad, if that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's Excellent. get started. All right. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for joining this morning. Um, my name is Brad Kruger. I'm over at Asset Inc. Uh, we work with the Health Board on evaluation on a variety of projects. 
Um, this morning, Chad and uh, his team has asked, have asked me to talk about um, evaluation. So I'm going to kind of dive in, um, give a, a few big picture uh, items, and then kind of dive into the nitty gritty a few times as well to hope give um, both a, a big kind of theoretical background to evaluation, but then also dive into some of the ways that it plays out within this projects and other projects that I know you guys are all on. Um, for those of you who are thinking uh, that name looks familiar, whether it be ACID or Brad, um, I was out at the, the conference both for the CRC project um, as well as the Good Health and Wellness project. So I, I know some of those names were familiar as you guys listed you off, um, off your names and affiliation. So it, it's good to be um, back with you all. I've got uh, an hour and a half worth of presentation. Um, so just buckle up and hang tight. Um, just kidding, it'll be maybe 30 to 40 minutes, so you won't have to listen to me too long, and then I'm going to hand it back to Chad um, and his team for a few announcements at the end. I can't see any of you, and I know we don't have cameras going, and so you've all got your mics on right now. If there are moments where you want to just um, either kind of get your comment in or ask a clarifying question, feel free to jump in. Um, it's a little difficult to hear, so if I keep going, just speak a little louder and yell at me. Otherwise, there's the chat function. Um, which some of you have kind of begun to chat in on the right side there on your control panel as well. Um, so I'll kind of keep an eye on that throughout the presentation. If you guys have questions, feel free to jump good morning. in. Otherwise... Can you, good morning. Can you hear me? This is Marilyn Yellowbird with Elbow Woods in Newtown, North Dakota. We can, yes. Good morning, Marilyn. Thank you for joining. We just got on. Uh, Robin Free and Lila Wells are here as well. Excellent. Thank you for joining. I'll be giving um, a presentation this morning on uh, kind of introducing evaluation and then diving into some of the ways that it plays out within this project. Uh, Marilyn, to get your team up to speed on kind of what you've missed. Um, yeah, any other housekeeping items or uh, items for clarification thus far, or should we dive in? Silence to me means we're diving in. All right, so without further ado, um, an introduction to evaluation. Um, presented um, in part by the Colorectal Cancer Screening Initiative. Again, I'm Brad Kruger. I work for ACET, and today is November 6. So kind of where are we headed today? So I'm going to talk about broadly what evaluation is, uh, why it's important to different entities, why it's important for the tribal communities, why the health board views it as important, um, and then why funders care about it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the details of evaluation as far as measures and types of measures and metrics that we collect um, and how that's done and how those different pieces can be used. Um, and then some next steps to help us kind of center what we've learned today to help us kind of take it the next step of using it in our work tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Uh, evaluation is something that I get to do uh, day in and day out, which I enjoy um, thoroughly, but I know that it can be um, not everybody's favorite. Uh, numbers and metrics uh, get a lot of eye rolls, uh, and it often is an area that people um, have some stigma or are a little bit scared of um, or intimidated by. Uh, if I can do it, you can do it too, uh, is my kind of friendly encouragement. Um, so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is ways that to simplify um, evaluation, which can seem very complex, but really at its uh, core is something that we all do in our daily lives. Um, and in projects like this, it's really more about developing a formal, a formal structure to it to make sure that it happens uh, kindly in a, a timely and organized manner um, is a lot of the work that we do. And so we'll kind of get into those pieces as we continue on today. So evaluation, what is it? Um, formally, it's the process of obtaining feedback to better serve people impacted by your project. Um, the Joint Committee on Standards for Educational Evaluation uh, write it in an even more complex manner. They say the systematic investigation of the worth or merit of an object. Um, so again, we can kind of start to see why people are not always uh, huge fans of evaluation when you talk about it in those terms. But I think as we break down the pieces, uh, it can be really applicable and it's incredibly important to the work that you guys all do um, through this project and the other uh, initiatives that you guys serve on. Um, so when we think about the process of obtaining feedback, uh, so those processes and those activities of feedback, and it can be as simple as asking a participant, you know, how did you think that went? Or debriefing with your team after and saying, you know, who was here at the meeting and who wasn't? Um, those are evaluation activities. 
um, because we want to continue to learn to better serve um, those within our communities that are impacted by our project. And so the process of evaluation um, kind of begins at the forefront in the planning stage of a project. So you begin to think around those evaluation questions around what do you want to know? What do you want to hope to learn through this project and through these types of questions? And what, um, why is that going to be important? So that evaluative statement is why is this knowledge important? How is it going to impact the work that we do? How is it going to help us better serve our community? Um, a lot of people tie evaluation into quality improvement. Um, and in some ways, they're connected, right? We, we hear and we listen and we collect these numbers and these stories and these um, data points to be able to help us to impact um, the project next time we do it, whether it's a, whether it's a community event, whether it's a five-year-long project. We want to have data points along the way to help us understand what went well, maybe what didn't go so great, and what are we going to do next time to help improve that. Um, and so beginning to think about that right from the outset is really important. And so that's why almost all evaluations will start with developing either a logic model or a theory of change or your evaluation question or statement to really guide the activities that you're going to do underneath that evaluation umbrella as you continue a project forward. Um, and then you're going to develop measures, right? So if you want to know who did we reach, we've got to know, well, how are we going to measure that? And so is it going to be sign-in forms? Um, is it going to be, you know, registrations? What does that tangibly look like? What's the practical nature of that? Um, and so that's the next step there. And then collection methods, again, how are you going to do that? Um, and then a big piece with evaluation planning is who's going to do it and when are they going to do it? Uh, I know from the few of you that I've met that you all wear lots of hats and run in lots of directions and play massive roles at your organizations. And so putting down a job title or a name and a timeline helps keep everybody on track um, around when these crucial pieces need to be collected um, and understood. And so that's kind of broadly the process of evaluation. And we'll dive into um, elements along that uh, as we dive in. To, to throw another definition at you um, before I get a little bit further, the American Indian Higher Education uh, Consortium developed an indigenous evaluation framework that I know we've presented on um, previously, and you guys may be uh, familiar with, um, but it draws on uh, kind of four key pieces that we'll discuss a little bit further, um, and specifically diving into traditional values, knowledge, and histories of tribal people um, in the United States, working to respect and serve tribal goals for self-determination and sovereignty, um, as well as provide opportunities for learning and reflection to uh, effectively create strong and viable tribal communities. And so there's a lot of conversation around evaluation and there's a lot of kind of high level conversations happening that um, trickle down into the, 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 the pragmatics and the practicalness and the instruments that you guys all then um, are working with day in and day out. So to keep moving along here as we think about evaluation, um, I, I began to talk a little bit about how does it work um, and so I'll talk in, in a minute here around um, types of evaluation. Um, but I think understanding that it's really about capturing the journey um, and involving feedback. And so uh, evaluation is a gift, right? The opportunity to hear feedback from our participants or for, from your participants or your community members is them offering that up to you. And so we keep that lens in mind as we conduct evaluations. Um, so it's capturing the journey of your project from the planning to the implementation, how things went, all the way to the backside of what were those outcomes? Did we move the needle? Did we make a difference? Is there something that we can hold on to? Is there a data point? Is there an activity? Is there a difference in the community that we can see um, to be able to show the, the results of our work? Um, and so it involves collecting the feedback from others. So those impacted by your project, those who supported your project, those within your project. Um, I know um, project staff and project partners, all of those people play a role in your project and they all carry um, a viewpoint and a perspective that can help your project move forward. Um, and so evaluation is really the process of learning how to collect um, and bring those pieces in line and in understanding with to build on your program. Um, so again, it honors cultural values and beliefs. Uh, it's the bedrock of evaluation, right? You can't do evaluation in isolation. Absolutely, the data points that you collect are surrounded by cultural values and beliefs. There's a context around that that's important to consider. Um, 
when you're conducting these things. And so one of the cool aspects that we get to do with the evaluation, and I know Asset, we're in Minnesota, so we're a step removed from the health board, which is in South Dakota. And then I know you guys are even further extended out. And yet along each step, step of that continuum is an effort and an intentionality around understanding the context in which these um, projects and evaluations are being conducted. So uh, those pieces are ingrained throughout the process and are incredibly important to the successful evaluation and understanding of whatever data you collect. So again, going back to the indigenous evaluation framework, um, it talks about three key pieces of ways of knowing. So there's the traditional knowledge, there's empirical knowledge, and there's revealed knowledge. And so traditional knowledge is handed down through generations, through creation stories, origins of clans, and encounters between ancestors and the spirit world. Um, this can be shared based on the history and experiences of the people to reinforce values and beliefs. Empirical knowledge then is gained through careful observation from multiple vantage points over an extended period of time, right? It's not just a one and done opportunity, but you continue to collect and reflect back on those ideas. And then reveal knowledge being the third um, non-Western way of knowing within the indigenous evaluation framework is acquired through dreams, visions, and spiritual protocols. So again, honoring that cultural value and those beliefs there uh, within evaluation to make sure that it's not just an isolated data point, but that the, the, the context around that and the stories around that and the journey around that data point influence how that's interpreted. Um, so we at Asset work really hard, and I know the health board works really hard um, to include that those elements within every step of the work that we do. Um, so why is it important, right? Why all of this energy? Why all of this attention? Um, why why hire Asset? Why um, why does the CDC? Why do funders? allocate money? Why are you guys allocating time to collecting these data points? Um, because it's important. And that's probably not a good enough answer. So I'm going to talk about a few reasons why I think that it is important. Um, so here are three kind of, we'll call them stakeholders or groups that are involved in evaluation that have uh, incredible uses, uh, both similar and different um, for evaluation data and evaluation reports and kind of the, those summary pieces. So why is it important for tribal communities? You all, again, wear many hats and you guys get to interact with your community on a variety of different levels. You have the opportunity to implement a wide variety of programs and they're not all gonna be equally effective. They're not all gonna be equally impactful. And so while one project may serve a certain slice of the community and another project serves a different slice of the community, it's important to understand those impacts so that as you continue your work forward, you know who you're serving well and where maybe some of those gaps are and how well program A versus program B is doing. And so it's not a it's not a process of saying program A is in and program B is out, but it's a process of understanding the influence of both of those so that tribal leaders can make decisions around which ways to go, who needs to be served, where are the opportunities, where are those impacts uh, possible and what do we have to address those um, issues that we know within our community and so from a tribal level it helps understand the program impacts at a really granular and tangible level. Why is it important to GPCCSI and so Great Plains the, the broader project? One of the big things that uh, is an opportunity with providing all of these different um, grants to tribal communities is an opportunity to learn from each other. And so evaluation makes sure that each community is helping to collect similar information um, to be able to influence each other's projects. So as we take a step back from the tribal community and we look at the regional level information, it allows each of your communities to share and uh, both successes and challenges and barriers and policy language and all of these different pieces that influence one another and it allows that opportunity to just share across. And so collecting at the tribal community benefits the project by that shared networking of systems. And so um, that's kind of a second layer. The third layer is why is it important to CDC, the funder, right? Um, and so we'll use CDC here, but whoever the funder is, they're probably gonna ask for some metrics, some measure, some evaluation data on the project. 
And this is where evaluation is a little bit less fun for a lot of people. Um, reporting back to funders are often um, a challenge, right? It's, it's data points that don't always feel like they fully reflect the project or the work done on the ground. And yet we know these things are important, not just because they're required, but um, for, uh, I think, more impactful and uh, sincere reasons. So yes, they're required, right? You just have to do it. Um, but two, CDC and funders collect this information because it's what helps them um, have those conversation at that very high decision-making level around where future funding is going to be spent, where future opportunities are going to lie. And so they need those data points, they need those resources, they need those stories and those numbers and those figures and those illustrations to say, here is where an opportunity lies or this community really bought into this project and they're just tipping the iceberg. And so I think we can continue to support that community in making these differences. And so it's important to continue this funding stream or provide a slightly different funding stream. If uh, the funder gets back information that um, is showing kind of high impact work in one area that they funded previously um, and some work that's maybe not being quite taken up by the community or it's not quite meeting the need, then they have the opportunity to pivot a little bit and understand what's happening on the ground level. And so you can see the way that each of these pieces impacts the whole process. And so evaluation is used a little differently at each stage, but it really begins on the ground, right? Your data, your stories, your your pictures, your um, your success stories, however you want to call it, um, is only as valuable as as strongly as it's connected on the ground. And so um, that means that the impetus is kind of put on those of you working in the program day in and day out to collect strong data to be able to influence these steps moving up, um, both internally as a tribal community, slightly externally as a regionally, and then all the way up to the funder level. Um, that data helps support this process and those stories help carry forward um, the work that you guys are all doing. So that's my uh, why is it important beyond just uh, its importance. Um, so I'm going to take just a quick moment just to grab a drink of water here um, and just open it up for comments if, if uh, there are other thoughts that you guys all may have there or questions of areas that I could clarify thus far. Silence is okay. That means I'm going to keep moving. Um, so let's get into the nitty gritty around evaluation a little bit. Uh, so in understanding why it's important, um, it then comes down to two different primary types of evaluation. You guys are probably um, familiar with these words, but I think it's good just to circle back and define them again. So there's two primary types, process-based process -based and outcomes-based. Um, process-based evaluation focuses on the completion of tasks or activities. Um, it tracks the information along the implementation of a project. So if it's a new project uh, or if it's a project in the planning phase, you're probably doing process evaluation. You're tracking things like meetings held, conversations had, who's at the table, um, what types of things were happening. Um, and it's they're generally easier, right? It's yes, no. It's, it's a number here, you know, 10 people were at this meeting. We got 50 community members to show up here. Um, and But it, it provides a learning opportunity. You know, we hosted five events this last two months. And every Tuesday, our attendance was triple that of our Thursday events. Like, that provides a learning opportunity, um, collecting those process-based. And then the outcomes-based focuses on the results of the events or the activity. So not only did we get more people on Tuesday, but when we looked at their, let's let's use Roland Cohen. We, we use their Roland Cohen test. I don't think this is true, but I'm just gonna say this. On Tuesday nights, people are more ready to learn. For whatever reason, the Tuesday events show greater improvements in scores. And so tracking those outcomes allows you to see those types of things. Or maybe it's um, the type of event or the space of the event um, that makes that difference. But it allows you to track those outcomes, um, those, uh, yeah, the, the results of your work, right? So it measures how your project made an impact. It's showing that, um, you know, this many people not only attended, but they learned something as a result uh, of that outcome measure that we tracked. So let's call that a pre-post test. They scored higher on their post test. That's an outcome. We know that they learned. Not only did they show up, that's a process question, but we know that they learned something. That's an outcome-based question. 
um, and they're harder to report and track, especially um, so in the colorectal cancer world around screening, right? Tracking screening rates is not always easy. I know this conversation has come up before, um, and there there are some ways to do it, but you you uh, it's just difficult to see the full impact of your work um, to be able to contextualize and capture everybody influenced your pro by your project because you touch base with them at an event and then you don't know what happens the next month. And so outcome measures are generally harder to report and track. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, they're also more often um, focused on, right? We don't think about process-based as often uh, because we don't see the value in them quite as strongly as we do outcome uh, measures. We always want to know, yeah, but what was the result? Um, but those results don't mean a lot if we haven't collected anything along the way. And so they're both um, incredibly important and oftentimes they're both being done um, to one extent or the other. So some sample evaluation questions. So you're, you're planning a project, you're kind of getting up and running and you're at that phase where you need to kind of understand um, where you're headed. And so you start from the ver very day one, day two, day three of establishing your sample evaluation questions. And so here's just a couple in front of you, um, but it's really that stage setting or that level setting around what do we want to know um, throughout our project and how can we begin to capture that? Um, so these examples both show you how an evaluation question is framed, but then how a comparative evaluative statement can be framed. And um, they're not entirely separate. They both serve their purpose, but some people prefer questions, some per people prefer statements. And so here's just some examples of both. So the evaluation question being, did our project serve people whom our project was designed for? Um, and then the statement associated with that would be, we want to know who participated and whether um, they were people who we designed our project for. So are the people that we reached the ones that we wanted to reach? Um, and so that's kind of a process-based question. And then the second one, what did people gain from attending our events? We want to understand the experiences of those who attended our events. Um, so again, a process-based question of understanding their experiences of how things went, how things, what their um, satisfaction was, to use another word that we probably hear often around evaluation, what their perspectives on the event was. And then the last one there, a very outcome heavy question, to what extent did project activities improve colorectal cancer screening? Uh, we wanna learn more about the changes made to improve colorectal cancer screening. Um, so again, a little bit harder to capture, but incredibly important, um, especially when we begin to think around program. Um, and so when we talk about evaluation, some people talk about program improvement, some people talk about program success. Um, or the reach of a project. And so that, that's a much more reach-oriented question around, yeah, but how much was completed? To what degree did we make a change? And so that's what those outcome measures help to measure. When we talk, so those, again, circling back, this is kind of how the process starts, right? We, we brainstorm, we think, you know, here's what we intend to do, and here's what we hope happens. And so let's design some questions or some statements that will help us measure what we hope to happen. So we hope to reach people who our project was designed for. We hope that they enjoyed our events and we hope that we made some difference around CRC screening. And so these are the evaluation questions that we then want to answer through our project. And so you develop a list of measures or metrics or um, whatever you want to, whatever terminology you want to use. And so again, you're going to tie those back directly to your evaluation questions and statements. Um, you indicate what you will collect to answer each question or statement. So if you want to know who did you reach, you've got to develop a measure around tracking who was reached. And so some method to do that needs to be developed. Again, so it's important to do that from the outset because you can't sit at the end of a project and look back and say, man, I wish we would have tracked that somehow. And so that's why this is very much a planning focused process that starts early on in the project. Um, and so you'll want to be able to collect that information and begin to think through those processes around what do I need to be using? What measures do I want to use? And then what tools do I need to use to be able to collect those measures? Um, and so you'll want to indicate what you will collect to answer each of those questions. And so you'll want a specific measure, whether that's a, whether that's a, a, a story from somebody around, you know, I was at this event and I had an excellent time. It taught me a ton about this. Or if it's a number of we got 15 people to attend and all 15 were in our target age population. So it's things like that. 
Um, so some sample measures, what you hope will happen. Uh, the number of people who attended events, the change in knowledge, so is there an improvement um, in their understanding of CRC screening, um, and then the number of the nature of the evidence-based uh, interventions that have been implemented. And so just understanding some of those potential measures based on those evaluation questions. So the, the stream kind of goes, your project planning, what you hope to happen, your evaluation questions, how you hope to understand whether or not those goals happened, those measures, what will be those points that answer our questions, and then lastly, getting down to collecting those measures. So how are we actually going to know what data points are collected um, to be able to answer those, those steps previously? So again, it takes many forms, um, and every project is going to be different. And uh, spending 40 hours a week in evaluation, I can tell you truly that no one size fits all. And most of our work centers around designing collection methods that are tailored, appropriate, and easy to use. Um, so allow for easy administration. So we work really diligently and really um, focused on how can we design uh, instruments and tools that are helpful and appropriate for the places that they're going to be implemented on. And um, so that's a, that's a collaborative process, it's a lengthy process, um, but it's important because ultimately, again, your data is only as good as you collect it. And so if you're collecting data that can be interpreted multiple ways or has um, a myriad of different issues within it, then it's challenging to move it up the pipeline from your community to uh, the health board up to the funder. And so uh, collection methods are incredibly important. Um, and there's a lot of theory and uh, debate around how to put these things together, but ultimately it's it's kind of a labor of love of just being diligent and intentional around what you're doing. Um, so again, you want to have uh, your audience in mind, you want to allow it to be easy um, and clear for whoever's going to take it or whoever you're going to ask questions of, um, and then you want to gather information that you can use. Um, and so the two primary types of information are quantitative and qualitative, and those words get thrown out around, uh, get thrown out a lot. Um, quantitative being numbers, qualitative being stories and perspectives and thoughts. Um, and then again, respect participants' time. You want it to be easy and quick. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity to hear, and so you want to respect their time. Um, and then you want to be able to honor their feedback. You don't want to collect something that you're not going to use or that's not going to be helpful. And so putting putting in that perspective as you begin to develop these collection methods are important. So again, I'm just going to jump into, again, uh, to further um, talk about quantitative and qualitative uh, data types. Quantitative, again, is numerical. If you're counting it, it's numeric, it's quantitative. And so it's how many people, how many events, um, how many points did they score, uh, to what scale did their um, knowledge increase, uh, what percent of people were screened, how many people were screened, those types of things um, are often the quantitative numbers that are asked to be reported out. Qualitative data uh, is uh, unfortunately often looked at um, in uh, evaluation as um, slightly less valuable. Um, I think there's a, a, a change in the atmosphere around that a little bit, a change in the wind when qualitative information is becoming a lot more strong and a lot more valued. Um, and it's all the non-numerical information. So it's stories and observations um, and interpretive information and thoughts and feelings and reflections and perspectives that are gained. Um, so sources can include interpretive drawings, photographs, responses to open-ended survey questions around why is this important or what did you learn. Um, interviews and focus groups are kind of the bedrock for qualitative data. Um, so getting people in a one-on-one -on -one setting and asking questions, you know, this is what we're hoping to do. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Or how has this impacted your life? Or what would you like to know more about? Um, or how is it that you came to understand this? Um, so a, a common example for focus groups is kind of understanding the um, community so that you can tailor a program. And so around colorectal cancer, a focus group could be asking questions of uh, what do you know about CRC screening? How did you learn that? Um, what pieces do you have questions on? Or what are those pieces that you think there's a misunderstanding on? And then you take that qualitative information and you go back as a team and you sit down and review um, and consider and make thoughtful decisions based on what you've heard from the community. Um, and so again, 
I would say quantitative data is often thought of as the only way to evaluate, um, and that's often the perspective offered. But I think qualitative data um, offers an incredible viewpoint into um, a community's perspective uh, and the degree to which a program is being um, utilized and understood um, for a program. And it offer it it off it often offers more direct room for improvement, right? So quantitatively, you get a number of um, you know, people aren't increasing their uh, their knowledge around this event. And so you, you might not know why that is. And then you, qualitatively, you sit down with three people that were at that event and you say, you know, this is something that we see in the data, but we don't under, really understand why that is. And so you get to hear, you know, maybe uh, there was too much, too much terminology or maybe it wasn't long enough or maybe there was an assumption made that not everybody was comfortable with. And so um, qualitative information really helps you dive into the the why behind the quantitative information. And so the two together are really powerful and you'll often see the two tied together um, on data collection methods and evaluations conducted. Uh, to continue to talk about quantitative data, um, so here's just some survey items that um, are common quantitative questions. So did the meeting meet your expectations? Did you learn something new? Did you use the information? Did it influence your work? And so the answers to those are yes, no, ones and zeros, right? It's very clear. Uh, whereas qualitative information, it requires a little bit more work. It's a little bit more challenging to work with. And so how did participation in this event influence your work? Well, you know, I learned about this, or I now understand, or I was able to share this with my partners, um, or I didn't get this at the event. And so, you know, I think there's room for improvement there. Um, so I just think that qualitative information helps answer the why in a lot of settings. Um, so again, that's kind of the theory behind uh, what goes on. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with the GPCCSI evaluation toolkit that was developed a few years ago. And so here are just some of those program evaluation tools that are within that toolkit. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about each um, and then we can follow up with those resources. I believe they're all in the appendix of that resource. So there's the patient knowledge test, which is a pre-post assessment. It asks both quantitative and qualitative questions around um, people's uh, knowledge on CRC screening. And so the hope is that following um, a consultation that their knowledge has increased. And then patient feedback survey is more around, you know, I'm not so much concerned around what you did or didn't learn. I want to know um, how you felt about it, what, how we can better improve the consultation. So was there, was there a terminology that was too high level? Do we need to reiterate certain points? Was there um, a point where we just, um, you know, we spent too much time on a certain item? And so their, their satisfaction, their feelings around certain pieces. Stakeholder dialogues, again, are those focus group questions. Um, and so getting the patient perspectives through focus groups um, understanding what the atmosphere, what the conversation in the community is around these pieces can be really helpful. And so that's the stakeholder dialogue um, focus group questions. The roll and colon test, I think you're all probably fairly familiar with. It's a pre-post. So before going through the colon, after going through the event, um, where is the knowledge gained um, with participants and how much was that dial moved? Um, end of event surveys, again, is kind of that feedback piece, that satisfaction. How did it go? What went well? What didn't go well um, around trainings? And then the educational material feedback form um, just assesses the effectiveness or the the impact of an educate of a of a resource that's offered. And so again, it's kind of a pre-post around you know what did you know previously? What did you know after? Um, and how much did that resource help you gain more knowledge? And so those are just a few that have de been developed. And those were developed a few years ago. Um, I know some have been used, others have been just used as resources to be f further tailored for the um, projects that you all work on. Um, but that's the kind of thing that I, uh, I won't throw great plans under the bus, but this is the kind of activity that they're uh, very ready and willing to support, and we at ACID are also ready to support. Um, if these program evaluation tools are really close to what you want to use them for, but they can just use some tailoring or some updates, um, that's the type of thing that we're happy to support. Um, so again, as I get close to wrapping up here, some next steps for evaluation. So as you begin this uh, new year and new project, what are those, um, what knowledge do you want to gain or what are those evaluation questions? 
Um, and how are you going to answer those? What collection methods do you need to have in place? And what are those um, specific questions, measures, and methods that are going to be in place? Um, and then ultimately identifying who's going to be responsible and on what timeline. Um, so that six months from now, if somebody new is in that role or if there's a new member on your team or the project changes hands um, or you forget what was developed six months ago because a lot happens in six months, uh, you'll be able to have a consistent document to go back to to reference. Um, so again, what I was kind of hinting at here is the GPC, GPCCSI technical assistance um, can be offered through conference calls or video webinars through review of drafts and providing feedback through sharing additional samples or resources by email. Um, so then you say, well, on what? So here exactly, um, to strengthen evaluation objectives through measurable questions and statements. So really um, defining clearly using those, um, many of you are probably familiar with the SMART objectives um, and utilizing those around your evaluation statements and questions um, or providing assistance in identifying data sources to address evaluation questions and statements. Again, providing feedback and suggestions on evaluation tools um, that are being developed or instruments that are being developed, um, reviewing draft analysis plans. So how are we gonna analyze this data? You know, I did all of these focus groups, now what? I've got you know hours of audio or maybe pages of transcripts and I really don't know what to do with it. Um, those are the types of things that um, the health board and ASIC can both provide technical assistance on. Um, and then I think the piece that often gets left out of evaluation that I hope to communicate today is that that data or the evaluation doesn't end once you've collected and looked at the data once. Um, part of honoring feedback and um, respecting the, the participants who provided that is sharing it back. And so presenting that data back to them in a compelling and informative, uh, informative and uh, hopefully a visually pleasing manner pleasing manner and so that you're not just collecting and then never circling back that opportunity to close the circle and share that data back with the community collected from um, I think is essential and continues the the trust and the learning opportunities um, within evaluation um, and then the last item there recommendations to form evaluation findings into action steps so we've collected all this now what we've shared it out now what um, how can we uh, build program improvements around what we have learned and so that's something that um, the health board as well versed that and asked it would be happy to um, provide assistance for as well. So I've been talking for um, a while now um, and I'm happy to help answer questions or clarify items or circle back and spend a little bit more time talking about items. I think we want to save um, about 10 minutes for Chad. Um, so we've got, you know, about five minutes if there are some questions that I can help um, answer from the audience. And then if you're uh, if you're not on the phone, if you want to type your questions into the text box. Yeah, thank you, Chad. Stuff. Yep. Were there things discussed today that uh, are different than what you've heard before or were surprising to hear or that you maybe disagree with? I think that's always a, a lively conversation. Uh, and I am one evaluator in the world of uh, thousands, if not millions. And so I'd be interested to hear um, those types of uh, pieces too. Has anyone used, um, if I go back a few slides, has anyone used any of these program evaluation tools in that toolkit? And what has the experience been with those? Has that been a, a, a good process? Did you feel like they, they fit your community and your project well? Hi, this is Marilyn Yellowbird from Newtown. Mm -hmm. We do the patient knowledge test. We do a pre-test and a post. And that always works out really nice. Good. Um, 
We and then we do have the Roland Colon at our big event in Bismarck. Um, we do a lot of education. We actually have a uh, they have stations, and one of the stations is we do um, education regarding colon cancer and mm -hmm. that kind of uh, stuff. We do the education first that what actually colon cancer is, and then on the next, the last station is where we show them how to use the FIT test and okay. why it's important. And they seem to like that. Good. It, it helps us. and. I, we really have gotten a lot of um, men within that age group, and a lot younger have gotten to um, begin to question now and and want and are actually asking us for the test, for the fit test. That's great. Thank you, Marilyn. Hey, Marilyn. Um, I was just wondering what kind of questions do you have in that knowledge uh, survey? Is that just the pre and the post test that we do, or is that something that you guys produce? No, oh, no, we actually did it ourselves. We took it's okay. just a very simple. Um, we only did four questions because we don't want to in overwhelm everybody. So we took the questions off that. In fact, the, it was your guys's uh, handout that we got from the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's uh, colorectal initiative paper. Do you, I don't know if you remember the sh educational sheet that you sent out. Yeah, absolutely, so you use those questions? Yep, we just took four questions Perfect. off of there. Um, we did the pre-test before, and then they would come to the education table. We gave them those, uh, the education sheet, and we did the demo, I mean, the showed them the there's a flip chart that we use to show what colon cancer is and the stages of colon cancer. Then, after the words, when they got their kit after with more education, then before they left, um, we gave them another. We gave them the post test. That's perfect. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions or, or anything for, for Brad? All right. Well, uh, thank you, Brad, for your, your presentation on the uh, program mm -hmm. evaluation. I appreciate it. Um, always really good information to have, especially for our subordinates and, and for ourselves and our program. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and touch on some, some updates with the, the program here. Um, so I'm going to see, I'm going to go ahead and share my, my monitor. Can you guys see uh, my screen here with the sample gas card receipt? Yes. Perfect. All right, so one of the things that and I know a lot of the, the sub awards are already doing this, but one of the things that we want to be able to submit to CDC, who's our funder, and be able to track is um, the gas card receipts. A lot of people do the, the um, reducing structural barriers, which is the whatever, the up to $33 amount gas card um, for people to return their FIT or FOBT kits um, to the uh, lab. So um, one of the things that we want to do is track when those gas cards are being purchased. So if you go out and if you buy all of them at once um, as a sub award, if you spend all of your money at once to buy all the gas cards and hold them for the year, if you guys could just scan us that gas card receipt so that we have it for our files and to submit with our final end of the year report, that would be fantastic. Or if you do it quarterly or monthly, if you go out and refill um, your guys' stock, for the gas cards, if you guys could send that over to us, and you can do that on the either on the monthly phone calls that you have with your patient navigators in each area, and that would be Gina, Deborah, and Eugene. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, or if you just want to send it over to us right away, either way. Um, and the the screen here is just some examples of the sample gas card receipt, and then a sample gas card tracking form. The other thing we'd like to do 
to start tracking the gas cards whenever you guys give them out. And again, I know a majority of you are already doing this. Um, <clears throat> but once you give those gas cards out, if you could track them with, I know some of you all do the last four digits on the gas card of the number, and then you just, I don't, we don't need a, a name um, of who got it, just the number and the date that it was given out. And then again, you can give that information back to us on the monthly phone calls with the patient navigators. Um, that way we're just able to track it and show CBC where the cards are going, when they're being purchased, and um, how many are being given out. And then that way we can keep a running total at the end of every year. Um, and it also gives us more um, data to, to offer them. Chad, then, this is Marilyn. I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when we purchase our bulk amount at the beginning, uh, our gas cards at the beginning of the events, um, mm -hmm. do you want a copy of, because I thought we sent that, do we send that in to you then? For how many gas yeah, cards you, we actually purchased? Yes, if you can just send us the, the receipt, if you want to photocopy it in or however you want to do it, uh, if you can just send that to us, we'll put it in your, your file um, for the end of the year report. And then for the gas cards, um, we use that form where they, with the name, the date, um, whether they were positive or negative, um, a birth date, a phone number, and then at the end we have gift or gift card or gas card. And then we have them initial off on that if they received one. Is that okay, or do you want an actual form like the one you're you're showing on the screen? Um, however is easiest for you, Marilyn, I would just recommend if you're going to send over that form, just black out their uh, date of birth and their name and all that stuff just so we don't have any HIPAA violations. Um, okay. So it's yeah. completely up to you. If you want to do a spreadsheet also just with the you know, the card numbers and the date they were given out, something that simple, that would be fine also. Okay, because I think that's what we did last time is what we, we just compiled all the information and just sent numbers to you guys, I believe. Okay. Yeah, that worked perfect. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is Jody Fetch. Um, we have a, a program that results are sent in the mail because we're not located um, right, you know, where people are. So we're sending them in the mail. And what we've done in the past is um, as we we use the, the sample gas card tracking form, like you have, I make a copy of the back of the card. Then I sign it and I have somebody in my office witness that the card's actually going into the envelope. Is that still okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, just as long as there's a way to track it so that we know it's being sent out. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, and does anybody else have any questions on that? No? Okay. So the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, you guys should have received an email with a, it's called a doodle poll um, last week for 2017-2018 subaward interviews. So this is for last year. So if you didn't have a grant with us last year, uh, you don't need to, to worry about this part, but if you did and you haven't filled out that doodle poll yet, um, I'm going to send out the doodle poll again um, at the end of this phone call. And basically what it is, it's evaluation like Brad was talking about. We go over six questions to evaluate um, how our team did, um, assisting you with implementing your grant in your community and any barriers and successes that you have. Um, basically, the doodle poll just broke down a list of times um, this week if you were available to do that. It only takes about 30 to 45 minutes maximum, um, sometimes quicker, uh, just depending on, on um, the readiness of the information. Uh, it's just a simple conversation between you and I on how your project went and if there's anywhere that we could improve um, or any more assistance that you guys can need. So I'll send that out again um, at the end of this, this phone call. And then I appreciate everybody who's, who's filled it out already. I know I have another uh, phone call for this at 11. So um, that's all I have. Uh, for this conversation. Again, thank you, Brad and Asset, for uh, putting this together for us. I know everybody here appreciated it. Um, and does anybody else have any other questions before we end the call? No? Okay. Brad, did you have anything else to add? Nothing for me. Just thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk about evaluation, and I appreciate you guys all. Uh, giving me a few minutes here.
Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate you. Uh, do you have anything, Gina? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, Tinka, did you have anything to add? No, I think you guys covered it. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and I'll send out that email here shortly. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This conference will now be recorded.